everyone, and welcome to our recruiting webinar series. I am Purnika, and I'm a part of the recruiting team here at Beams. And today's hot topic of discussion is driver retention. So as we can all agree, um, driver turnover or driver attrition, driver leaving is somewhat of an ever-present reality in the logistics industry. And every business owner has to not only come to terms with it, but also constantly monitor it and control it. Just because if it goes unchecked, we can all agree that the cost of driver churn can end up significantly impacting your business, both in terms of revenue as well as overall quality. And so I'm very excited as we get to approach the topic of driver retention, both very 360, um, and we're approaching it both from the perspective of a recruiter and a contractor. So uh, to talk about it from the recruiter's perspective, we have with us Shivam. Shivam, who is an expert in hiring and recruiting some of the best driving talent in the industry and has uh, deep industry knowledge when it comes to hiring in the logistics space. Welcome, Shivam. And, and then to contribute to the discussion, uh, we have Vikram. Vikram, who is here to speak to us purely from a contractor's perspective. Um, he's someone who has been contracting with FedEx Crown for over uh, five years. And as someone who has been scaling and growing his business, Vikram can attest to the pain that is driver churn. So welcome, Vikram. So Shivam, uh, just to kick things off um, and coming back to the topic of retention, I guess purely from your experience of interacting with the contractors, how would you recap or how would you summarize what are some of the top reasons why, you know, these drivers left contractors in 2022? Yeah, no, absolutely. Thanks, Pranika. Uh, so, you know, for those who've been watching our monthly webinars on recruiting, last year, around this time, we did a similar topic, right? Uh, where we tried to shed light as to why drivers quit. So every time an existing FedEx driver wants to leave an existing contractor and join another one and applies to us, we ask him and try to interview him and understand why he's put in a said contractor simply because he's staying within the industry, probably for the same pay, but he's shifting jobs. And we, we, we try to understand why he's shifting his jobs uh, just to give more perspective to the contractor that may hire him next. And using that, we get you know a lot of insight into why people quit. Some are very obvious and some not so obvious. So, you know, uh, the top five reasons that we've been seeing is very similar from what we saw last year. The trend's pretty much in line. Uh, you know, the first one, which keeps coming up over and over again, is drivers quit in because of feeling like they've been shorted. That seems to be a recurrent theme that we see all the time. Uh, you know, drivers keep feeling that, hey, I didn't get my fair due. My pay uh, was, uh, you know, I was promised X dollars, but I got 30 bucks, 40 bucks less. And the contractor did not have, you know, a fair enough explanation. And he's effectively cheated me. I don't trust him. I don't want to work with him. Uh, you know, and, and we'll get into each of these uh, as we move on. But, you know, the second theme is, you know, someone who didn't like the schedule he was being given to, uh, who didn't like the hours. Maybe he had a very late pickup, uh, you know, which kept him uh, at the job till 5 p.m., 6 p.m., uh, so that seems to be a recurrent theme as well. Uh, the other one, which has gained in uh, you know in significance over last year, is trucks. We see drivers increasingly being very conscious of the you know the equipment that they're using, the trucks that they're driving. Uh, you know, it could be that hey, I'm not comfortable with said truck, or it could be that you know I keep having to deal with frequent breakdowns, which waste hours of the day. Uh, mostly, most of them are on flat pay, so they don't kind of get paid for the two hours they waited for the mechanic to come. Uh, and it just frustrates them. It gets them concerned for their own safety. That was something we saw last year, but that seems to be becoming a little bit more predominant uh, over the last you know, six to eight months. And, you know, the other one, uh, key issue, obviously, is natural churn, right? That, hey, you know, I've moved locations. I'm, I found a terminal closer to my house. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I move cities for whatever reason. And that kind of summarizes the main reasons as to why people claim to be leaving one contractor for another. 
but there's obviously a whole host of other reasons why people are just le- leave in maybe driving for FedEx altogether and applying for other positions. Uh, and, you know, hopefully in the, over the next 20, 25 minutes, Vikram can shed some light on, you know, churn he's seen. We can go into each of these in more detail and we can give you our perspective as to how we see a contract that can tackle it to try to address it and to reduce it wherever possible. Because as Monica mentioned, we've always been saying, you know, recruiting, uh, the best type of recruiting is retention. Uh, this industry sees as high as 2% ret- attrition a week, which is expensive. You you spend, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars, like hundreds of thousands of dollars training drivers, getting them, you know, finally, you know, efficient on their route to a point where you're making money on them and then have them quit two weeks, three weeks or a month later. That's just an expensive ordeal. I'm not saying, it, you know, retention won't happen. Uh, attrition won't happen. It is just unfortunately a reality of the industry. But in it, addressing it is key to addressing your bottom line uh, and it's to increase in profitability, you know, a theme which every contractor is looking to address, especially in 2023 as we, you know, walk into uncertain economic times. But with that said, uh, you know, Vikram, I, I, I give you a bird's eye view of kind of the attrition problems that we've seen. Uh, if you want to, you know, what, what in g- generally, what have you been seeing over the last year? And then we can kind of take each of these individually and dive deeper into them. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, the points that you brought up, right. Uh, Turnover is natural in this business. And, you know, for me, it was, uh, you know, getting used to when I got into this business back in uh, 2018, right? Why is there? So I, you know, very soon I realized that's just the nature of this beast, right? So uh, I, you know, I could take some actions that would address some of the points that you brought up. And actually the first three that you mentioned, right? Those are very easily addressable, right? Essentially being transparent, you know, about the way you pay right? Uh, when you hire somebody, uh, everything from giving access to, you know, the payroll electronically, meaning they are not hounding you. Hey, I got paid this. And, but after taxes, by the way, I mean, you know, this is, you know, constant feedback that we receive. Hey, how much am I going to make after taxes? You know, and, you know, my response is like, I don't know what your tax situation is. Right. So I think being transparent over there helps. Uh, the second thing you brought up was trucks, right? Uh, again, major factor, right? Um, you know, back in, you know, 2020, when there was, you know, uh, supply chain issues, you know, you could not really source vehicles, you know, considering, you know, uh, all the volume that you were getting, right? So, uh, but now that problem has kind of gone away. So you're right. I mean, trucks, you know, badly maintained trucks. And I'm not even saying you have to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars just, you know, uh, you know, uh, updating a fleet, although, you know, there are pros and cons for doing that as well. And then, of course, scheduling again, um, you know, if you are transparent about and, you know, we get into, you know, just more granular stuff. But if you've interviewed somebody who uh, only wants to work Mondays to Fridays and now you put them, you know, you know, on the weekends or if you have pickups that forces folks to stay out. Right. I mean. Unfortunately, that is the case, right? Operationally, we are required to, but what are you doing? I mean, that's some of the things that we can discuss. That makes sense. Uh, so, you know, let, let, let's take the first one, right? And then we'll obviously get into uh, other other points of this, but around pay, right? So that's a recurrent theme we see over and over again. We've addressed it multiple times on our last webinars. From a recruiter standpoint, what we tell everyone, and we don't see enough contractors doing this, is paying attention on the onboarding part of an employee. The first couple of days and the first week is typically the most critical part of a new employee's journey. Uh, You know, it's very critical, especially now when times are a little slower, when you can take a breath, you don't need to kind of rush into getting the the guys into the truck. A proper onboarding where effectively, you know, if not an employment contract, if you know that's not something you want to get into, at least a one pager telling them exactly how they get paid. That hey, this is your base pay. These are the bonuses that we offer. Like hey, this is service bonus. This is the kind of the condition that has to be met. Uh, this is your safety bonus. This is the condition that has to be met. These are your stop thresholds. This is the stop bonus. Like whatever be your pay structure, to clearly spell it out uh, is essential. Uh, and so, you know, I, I'm sure a lot of people do that verbally, but having a written piece of document because memory 
may not be uh, you know uh, well served when looking back at this a couple of weeks later when he gets his first paycheck and having that document kind of removes all doubts and suspicion from either party's mind that hey here's the document we shared it with you here's the signed copy where you received it just review it and if you you, you have any questions we can go back into dealing with this obviously the best place to start is having a simplistic structure uh rather than having like five different variables and multiple tiers but i understand the contractor wants to kind of engineer the pay where the business interest and the yeah you know the the the, in, the driver's interest are aligned so i i don't think now is the forum to talk about simplistic structure but whatever the structure be i strongly believe that the onboarding part where you at the very least get that on paper get it signed share it spend 10 minutes walking them through is essential uh you know vikram what are your thoughts on this uh, what else do you think can be used to address this particular issue that keeps coming up i think uh, you brought up a very good point and i would argue actually this starts even you know a lot earlier not i mean this is even before onboarding right when uh mm-hmm. you know you know we are placing ads on indeed right typically we say there's a range in pay right is a starting and you know you kind of specify that and of course it's based on experience and you know other things the type of route right so you might have candidates applying you know expecting you know of course the higher end so what we want to make sure is while we are onboarding even like you know after they get through the you know go through the first advantage process when we actually have in person meetings even then right uh, our you know bcs typically will kind of gauge the experience part and kind of you know give us feedback that this candidate you know is likely falling you know at this point right but then and like you said the second part of course is making them you know go through this onboarding process which includes uh you know just laying out the pay structure right if you are giving safety bonuses right i mean so there's the fixed pay part right but there's also the incentives that a lot of contractors you know give out based on service uh, for safety for attendance for any reimbursement towards you know their expenses you know for example they might be using their you know cell phones so i i think uh, yeah it is it is very critical uh, to have that at least transparency right from the beginning yeah no makes sense good point on the indeed ad right so you're right most contractors will give a range and that the higher end of the range typically includes overtime it includes maybe work in the weekend it maybe includes someone who's experienced you know for the bulk truck but you know bulk truck route or stuff like that and candidates kind of stick to the higher end yeah, exactly and it's important i i understand you know you want to kind of attract the best talent out there and thus you give the range it's important that you specify where they're starting and what their path is to that potentially higher amount yeah. and hey exactly. you're starting at you know 130 dollars a day but you can get to that 170 if you hit you know maybe a particular stop threshold or stops per hour or whatever metric you're measuring or you know time in the company uh we so so that makes sense that uh and i i think again uh, you know just to summarize clear onboarding clear communication ideally written paperwork on terms of the pay structure goes a long way because i know majority of the contractors are not doing wrong by the drivers but drivers are the most important assets that they have after the trucks and the routes yep. and thus uh, you know it i i think it will serve you very well to take that 20 30 minutes to get that paperwork set up and that time with the driver to ensure that they don't leave for the wrong reasons yep. uh you know jumping into the second point uh, you know vikram vehicles seem to have been a topic that's come up i i i think we've all seen social media of all these really sad accidents that have happened uh, or i mean they keep happening but i believe you know we've just seen a little bit more of it uh, over the last 6 to 12 months where people are starting to get concerned about safety uh, you know especially with you know extreme weather that's happening and all of that and, and, and you know and you address that sometimes spending 100 thousand dollars to change a truck is not an option so what can a contractor do there uh, to kind of address these issues so starting right uh when i first got into this business of course i you know had very limited knowledge of the fleet that i was you know uh inheriting um 
you will not believe this, but some of these vehicles were almost 15 years old, like old diesel freight liners, right? <laughs> so uh, what I found out was on the routes that we have, you know, had them assigned, we would, you know, see significant turnover, right? Meaning, why was it? Uh, I mean, our thoughts were, you know, these are really nice, dense, mostly residential routes, no businesses, meaning no pickups. But the turnover on those particular areas were, you know, tended to be a little higher. And, you know, within the first three months, we realized uh, our vehicles uh, on those, I mean, on those routes that we had assigned would constantly break down, right? Meaning you have a driver who just started their route and now uh, the vehicle has to be towed. You, and again, this is a, you know, a very long process, right? You're talking like maybe half a day just gone. If tow truck showing up, you know, you showing up with a spare vehicle, now moving all those packages, right? So uh, it's a lot of cognitive overload now on this driver who still has to finish his day. Although, you know, you try and help, uh, you know, take their, you know, load away, but it's, it's just, uh, you know, one of those things. And mm -hmm. impact it's going to have is, you know, on the morale. So, you know, let me ask you this. So, you know, this is something that may happen, even with your best intentions and your best efforts, uh, you're going to have truck breakdown. How do you deal with it? How do you compensate uh, the driver, like either through helping him uh, uh, get, you know, somebody else to take half his route or pay? Like, is there any compensation structure that you plan? Yeah, it's a mix, right? So first thing we want to do is make sure that we don't have a service failure, right? Meaning uh, we, will, we would not expect a driver who has lost maybe, you know, four hours, you know, just to restart their day, be on that route themselves, right? That's clearly, you know, you're not setting the right expectation. And if you do that, again, uh, it's high tendency this, this driver is not going to be wanting to work for you in the long term, right? So that is number one. And typically what we'll do is the next day, you know, we will make sure that this driver has a lighter day. Maybe they only work half a day, right? So, I mean, there's certain things that, you know, we typically do that essentially compensates, uh, uh, you know, for any time lost or any frustration that we feel that were beyond our control. Because, I mean, even a new vehicle, I mean, we bought like, you know, 15 new vehicles just last year and you had like brand new vehicles, just engines just blowing up, right? So, uh, I mean, some things are just beyond your control. So one thing I've, I've got a lot is, Rather than, you know, one is obviously the state of the vehicle. The other is the cleanliness. It seems like especially, uh, you know, contractors who don't dedicate trucks per driver and it's just yeah. a, a little randomized. A lot of these drivers kind of walk into really, really dirty trucks. They're like, hey, there's food line over there or this, this truck's not been cleaned in the last year or so. Uh, you know, and it's, it, I, I understand, again, a contractor has a thousand things to do. But this, obviously, if a driver has to spend 10 hours within a small you know, metal box, it kind of makes sense that these trucks should be cleaned, right? Or is that uh, really difficult of a thing to do? Uh, and, and you see that as a positive impact on a driver? Yes, I mean, for the most part, uh, right? You will have the same guy driving the same truck at least five days out of the week, right? I mean, that's kind of, but unfortunately, right, we run seven days, so they might be, you know, at least one or two days here or there where uh, your driver, you know, you might have somebody else driving that vehicle. And it, I mean, it causes frustrations. If you have essentially maybe your lead driver now driving and not keeping that, you know, vehicle clean. I mean, clean, I'm going to say just, you know, things that you like, you know, food, for example, leftover. Uh, I'm going to call them apple juice bottles, but that that's not really apple juice, uh, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, that, you know, that's, again, one of those big issues. And you would, I mean, not only that, things like small things like, hey, I had, you know, I keep my truck, you know, full as, as far as fuel is concerned. Somebody else drove my truck on the weekend. Now they brought it to the station with, I don't have enough fuel to essentially even go to the pump, right? So these, again, some of the frustrations that, uh, you know, that are very common, right? Uh, and I would say a lot of it, I mean, a contractor, you know, can only do so much, right? Because, I mean, what we tell drivers is, hey, this is, again, cleanliness is not a, not a part of your pre and post trip inspections, but this is your office, right? Literally, this is your office. So please, you know, you know 
maintain it to a level where you know i, I remember when we were contractors uh, and we got a lot of feedback on truck uh, cleanliness we a couple of days we went in at like 6 6 30 a.m with trash bags to try to clean the trucks and oh my god the amount of apple juice bottles that we found uh we we, we used to wear like the surgical masks i uh, sorry the gloves but it was disgusted and every time we get that feedback from a driver that hey these, these trucks are absolute mess i feel that because uh, <laughs> we, we've, we've tried to deal with it uh but no that makes sense now uh you know just kind of the next one that we keep seeing over and over again uh, is around schedule and late pickups, right? Yeah. Uh, or hours or, hey, uh, you know, I had to be back by 5 p.m. Uh, or I had to pick up a child from daycare at 5 p.m. and I got this pickup that was listed or I'm not available on Mondays and Fridays but the contractor couldn't work with me. To this, just as a recruiter, I understand a contractor not having too much flexibility because it's not possible. And if yeah. you've got 20 drivers with 20, and everyone has a life outside, but to accommodate 20 people, it's next to impossible. Um, but the late pickups is something that, you know, uh, I can understand from a driver's perspective. He's a good driver. He finishes it out by 4 p.m. He needs to sit around for a couple hours waiting for that one last pickup window. How, how how do you fix that as a contractor? Do you like try to get the pickup moved? Do you like move it around people? Like what what do you do with them? So I'll start with the scheduling part, right? So if if somebody has explicitly wanted to work, uh, you know, a Monday to Friday schedule, right? And if you onboard them, and then you turn around and you tell them, hey, um, you know, we are really sorry, but. Uh, you know, we need you on the weekends. I think you're again setting up your, you know, setting yourself for failure. You will see driver churn over there. I mean, so that's kind of one of the things that you should plan ahead of time, right? In no matter how short you're on drivers, but if you're just thinking for a banded solution, and if you're not transparent on what this actual schedule, you know, you want versus what the driver wants, there's going to be a problem, right? There's conflict over there. Second thing, uh, what do drivers typically, you know, dislike, you know, uh, about, you know, their routes mostly is late pickups, right? Unfortunately, that's something that's beyond our control, right? Uh, to give you specific examples, uh, FedEx office, right, has yeah. late pickups. And some of them, the, the earliest you can pick up is 6 p.m., right? So you might have a driver, you know, getting done with their route by 4 p.m. And now they're just sitting, just waiting for this pickup, right? Uh Again, this is disliked by most folks, right? I mean, you want to get done, you want to go home. Uh, on our end, what we do is we rotate uh, that particular pickup, for example, right? Um, so meaning you might be doing this late FedEx office pickup only once every, I want to say, four or five months for a week. And not only that, we incentivize you for that week that you are late. Essentially saying, hey, you know what? We pay for your dinner for that week. So I think those things kind of help. Like, move it around people. Like, uh, do, do you get somebody else who may not be servicing that specific CSA, but a close one uh, to come and uh, pick it up? Or It's the same CSA. It's essentially your driver, yeah, your driver rotation, right? So let's say. The routes get rotated? No, so only the pickup gets moved, right? So, but, so uh, this is a typically scheduled pickup. That means it's going to show up on that same route every sure. single day, right? So what the BC will do in the morning is uh, through FCC or the scanner essentially is, or even by calling CPC, move it to the new work area, essentially the driver who's going to be doing this pickup for that week. Understood. That makes sense. That's interesting. Yeah, this is great. Um, and... Just to bring the uh, topic back to retention, of course, as you guys covered, driver pay and schedule, all of these things play a big role in driver retention. But there is something to be said about, you know, just purely the motivations or uh, inherent motivations of a driver who's wanting to stay. So uh, I guess I had a question for Vikram, like at Prologix or at your operations do you sort of offer anything besides driver pay, like more growth opportunities for the drivers that would make them kind of want to stick around? I mean, that's a great question, right? So, uh, I mean, 
So the growth opportunities, well, so there are two parts to this, right? How do we incentivize drivers, right? So how do we, you know, what uh, Shivam brought up earlier is, you know, starting from pay, right? How do you progress folks from, you know, from a certain baseline when they're starting out to maybe, or, you know, on the upper end. And again, it's based on, hey, uh, as you progress, as you, you know, your efficiency improves, uh, you know, you will see that progress. Uh, if you are, we're going to call it like a difficult route that is maybe business heavy, or you're driving a bulk truck, or you have a route that is has a lot of pickups, right? Your compensation is going to reflect that. Uh, meaning, if some folks give out stop bonuses, right? Uh, some of these in a bulk truck, you you cannot, you know, do 150 stops, right? Uh, so you, you you kind of have to compensate uh, over there. Uh, other parts, I mean, it's again baking other incentives, right? That are beneficial, you know, to all parties, right? Uh, meaning service, uh, safety, uh, attendance, right? Uh, and any anytime during peak, for example, when you are, you know, seeing maybe twenty twenty five percent extra volume. So rather than hiring uh, a lot of inexperienced drivers meaning you are renting vehicles, higher probability of getting into accidents. If you can, for that period, uh, you know, compensate your existing drivers a little bit more, I think that, you know, it works in everybody's benefit as well, right? Um, other than that, I mean, you know, we've tried uh, health insurance, medical benefits, you know, 401ks, I think we discussed that uh, on our last call. Uh, that sometimes helps with retention, sometimes does not, uh, you know. Um, yeah, I mean, in a nutshell that. So just to add to that, right, Rico, uh, and it's interesting on the benefits. So I was having a word with some of the recruiters here and trying to understand how important are benefits. So, and it does seem that, you know, CDL drivers, because we recruit a lot of those, they really care about the benefits because these guys are career drivers. They probably have a family back home. Uh, and they need, you know, the health benefits or they're, they're interested to understand 401ks because A, they're earning a little bit more than a PND driver. B, they obviously, you know, are looking at this as a career and long term. But one would argue, right, if while we say that, hey, most PND drivers are not career drivers, except for maybe 5, 10% of those, if you want to attract career drivers, do you not think, uh, you know, providing benefits becomes an essential part? Uh, of your, uh, your pay offering, or do you see that just that age group just not caring? Yeah, and I think yeah, I would you know uh, add to what you just said. You know, the second part of your your statement was that age, that demographics that we you know typically work with. I think you know uh, you know I'm invincible. Uh, you know I cannot get sick, I cannot get hurt, and you know even if I do, I can just shrug it off. You know. Yeah. Suck it up and do my job, right? But unfortunately, as we grow older, we realize that's kind of, you know, not the case. So. That makes sense. Uh, and, you know, and we were discussing this on our prep call yesterday uh, where you brought up an interesting part about culture. And uh, while that doesn't always jump out when we ask people why they quit, but that does seem to be a strong reason to keep people. It might not, uh, you know, in a way stop them from leaving, but it would... Uh, it creates stickiness of sorts, right? And it's difficult. Uh, you know, the terminal, they kind of are just there together for 15, 20 minutes. They don't really have a common meeting spot. They're, they're loading their trucks and just doing the, you know, pre and post, uh, the pre and, pre and post and leaving. And typically when they come back, you know, they come back at different times. How do you build culture when that's kind of the situation, right? And that's seven day ops. Uh, it, it, it just seems to be, very, it's easier said than done, right? Yeah. And I think most contractors kind of struggle with that whole concept of culture. Uh, how do you instill it? Because you had some interesting points. Yeah, I mean, so I think it starts with like your team, you know, your management team, right? Your operations team, uh, making sure that, uh, you know, the onboarding is spot on, right? Uh, that the new driver that you're onboarding is, you have a route for them that you've kind of want them to take over. And, you know, that's kind of what we were discussing, you know, yesterday, if you're having a bad day, meaning a lot of, maybe you had a couple of call, call offs, are you going to, you know, essentially overwhelm this new hire and throw them on a route, uh, you know, knowing perfectly well that they might not be successful, right? 
or they might not have enough training, uh, right? So things like that, uh, making sure that there is no inherent bias because it's, you know, bias meaning, uh, you know, as folks spend some, I mean, they, they spend about an hour to two hours, you know, at the terminal in the morning, typically, and that's kind of the only time they will, you know, uh, you know, be as a, you know, together as a team, right? So I think those those are critical times. So, uh, you know, when you have management that, for example, does not, you know, play favorites as far as, you know, when folks ask like time off, for example, or, you know, if a route becomes available, right? It's, it's essentially uh, going to the guy who was actually being trained on it, for example, and also, I mean, if something happens on the road, right? I mean, what does your teamwork look like? I mean, would people want to help each other out or not, right? And the way we promote it, I mean, it's it's difficult, like, you know, just because we don't spend enough time together, I mean, on working. And also with seven days, you know, it's just difficult to have, you know, company events. But uh, I think we are one of the lucky uh, stations that don't have a Sunday service uh, pretty soon. I mean, I think it's like March 15th and... I think I mentioned yesterday, so I told my ops folks, hey, the first one day that the first Sunday that we are off, we are gonna throw a big party. So please look for a venue and that's what we're gonna do. That makes sense. No, uh, I you know I, I keep hearing from some contractors, especially the ones who have a smaller team where they can be more on on you know hands on, is hey, I you know, some days I take donuts in, some days I take coffee in. Uh, some days I, you know, randomly put some Gatorade bottles if it's really warm in all their trucks, and uh, you know they try to do cookouts. They just uh, they they do the little they can, yeah. and I I kind of end that discussion with the last bit saying a lot of times management doesn't know the BC and how they're treating the drivers, uh, especially with people who are not that hands on, uh, and just. Very recently, till last week, we had this fantastic contract uh, uh, you know, in the line hall space who kept having his drivers quit. Uh, you know, uh, they they quit every quit couple of weeks, even if we recruited them or if he found them through his source. He was super puzzled, right? So he's like, "Hey, I speak to these guys. They seem great, and they quit, and then they don't give me a straight answer. Uh, they don't pick up my calls. Can you find out what's happening? Because our recruiters have kind of built a relation. We started calling, and we got a list of what." five people who quit over the last two months and we found something very peculiar. Right? So we found that basically the manager was a, extremely rude. Like he had a you know dirty mouth. Uh, he, he used to be rude, agitated. Uh, you know, they asked stupid questions you know, because they were new. He'd get very, very agitated with them. Uh, you know, he wasn't being spared on scheduling, uh, at least allegedly. Uh, and these people literally felt like, hey, we're, you know, a there are enough jobs out there. Yep. I don't need to be de- dealt with, you know, with disrespect. And they quit, and they just assume the management was kind of, uh, you know, in the know, and thus they didn't even bother uh, complaining uh, about the BC. And uh, you know, as a result of this feedback, the manager had a you know, very strict sit down with their, uh, like the management had a strict you know, sit down with the BC. And made it one of their KRAs saying, hey, if drivers quit and if we hear one more complaint against you, you know, that's kind of it for you. And I mean, it's been two weeks, so I don't have the results for that. But I feel like that happens more often than not. Uh, you know, you might be a great manager, genuinely respecting your employees, but your BC, you know, just because of the stress of the job or, you know, in, in effort of getting things done, uh, would not treat them fairly, at least would not be perceived to be treating them fairly. Maybe they play favorites. And it's important if, if you start seeing a trend of people quitting without, you know, quote unquote reason, I highly encourage, uh, you know, contractors to pick up the phone and call and try go that extra mile to understand why someone quit. You know, I know our industry doesn't have the concept of an exit interview, but, you know, we have been recruiting, are trying that out with a lot of uh, contractors who are having attrition problems and that will kind of give you a better understanding of what you can fix and some things may be in your control uh, you know a lot of times people just say hey i wasn't getting paid enough and i understand that's not currently in fedex contractors control but other things the other variables yep. uh, just might be 
and taking that little bit of effort to understand rather than accepting this as an industry norm might give you surprising results. Yeah, I mean, I would add, you know add to that, right? Uh, this also goes on, you know, to like, is your business or your operations manager, is he actually a good manager or how did you promote them? How did you hire them? Uh, because a lot of people think, you know, I can take my best performing driver essentially and make them a manager. Uh, surprisingly, that's not, uh, that's not a good idea because managing people versus delivering and, uh, you know, driving a very, this a very different skill set altogether. So that's what I, you know, you know, basically when I talk to newer contractors is, you know, you know, kind of point that out. Don't fall into this trap of, you know, essentially promoting your best driver who's doing 30, 40, maybe 50 stops an hour. And now you essentially have them managing people, right? Just it's, it's a very different skill set. That makes sense. Yeah, that is true. So um, I guess as my last uh, wrap up notes, I also wanted to touch a little bit on and I guess you already covered about like effective communication with the drivers. Um, and I guess uh, a good BC plays a very big role in that. Uh, and so uh, if you could Vikram like wrap up with a good story of a good BC that you've hired and what did you do differently with your BCs? Uh, that sort of make them work for you and not against you? That's a, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, I have a great management team. I mean, that's the reason why I think I, you know, I say this all the time. That's the reason why I'm sitting over here talking to you and not behind the wheel delivering packages, right? <laughs> uh, I think it starts with, you know, trust, right? Uh, and trust uh, control, right? Trust meaning... Uh, you know, we've invested, you know, you know, a significant amount in acquiring, you know, let's say business. Uh, I don't believe, for example, in micromanaging folks, right? So meaning the expectations are uh, set, right? Uh, and you know, as far as accountability is concerned, I mean, everybody knows, you know, what, how this is a very simple business, right? Um, and my management team knows very well, like what is our expectations, right? Uh, not just to, you know, the owners of the company, but to, you know, FedEx, to employees, right? Uh, if you can, you know, get this part done, I, I think you will be on the right path. Awesome. Great. Uh, I think we should just wrap this up now. Thank you so much both for your insights and just to uh, recap uh, five factors that go into driver, good driver retention is a, of course, driver pay being cognizant of your driver schedules, C clean trucks. Um, and then of course there is effective communication with the drivers and a positive work environment. Uh, so thank you guys. Um, I will see you in the next webinar. Thank you so much. Thanks, Parnika. Thanks, Shivam.